what can they do to stop it? Well, the game, the game strategy is clear. They've deployed it before, right? So, um, you know, they'll, they'll say things like, this is welfare for politicians. Um, this is just corrupting free speech. You don't believe in the First Amendment if you don't believe that, you know, the Koch brothers or the Soroses have the right to spend unlimited amounts of money in political speech. Um, and so I think the way around that fight is to agree free speech is the fundamental value. And nothing of the reforms I support would like try to restrict people's ability to speak. What we're talking about is congressmen raising money. We're not talking about individuals speaking in the marketplace. So you have a very loud voice, Joe. Your voice is heard by millions. And nothing in our Constitution should permit the government to be able to suppress you at all so long as you're within the bounds of decency, or at least uh, not decency, because that's not a bound boundary that this podcast obeys often, but, yes. but at least if you're not you know, spreading false rumors and causing great harm. But the point is, um, even though this free speech needs to be protected, we still should be able to focus on the influence, the economy of influence congressmen live under, when they spend 30 to 70 percent of the time sucking up to the Lesters to fund their campaigns. That should be a focus of regulation without the First Amendment getting in the way because we want a Congress filled with people who care about what their voters want, not what their funders want. The framers didn't create a constitution to replicate an aristocracy. They were fighting an aristocracy. They had a system where there was a house, the House of Lords, that had to ask the aristocracy, what do you want? And everything could be blocked if the aristocracy didn't like it. Well, we've replicated that system more efficiently in America than they had there because we have a system where both the House of Representatives and the Senate is filled with people who are obsessed with a single question, what do my funders want? And if they can't answer that question in a way that supports the legislation, they're not going to support the legislation. Or if it's important for them to block legislation, they will block legislation. And that's the dynamic of Washington right now. Um, uh, Francis Fukuyama describes uh, our government as a vetocracy, vetoocracy. And what he means by that is that there are so many places where influence, powerful influence, can block the ability of the government to do something that it just can't do anything anymore. And that's, I think, the consequence of allowing this corruption of money to be so deeply woven into our political system. Is it possible to fix? Yeah, it is possible to fix. Because, you know, for, for example, H.R. 1 plus Ro Kahana's bill, all perfectly constitutional. You wouldn't have to amend the Constitution to do it. I think that bill alone would solve 80% of the problem. The possibility, the problem isn't like conceiving of what changes have to happen. The question is, how do you build the political movement to get there? And what that takes is leaders willing to say, we have to fix this corrupted democracy first. And, and leaders who stop, like pretending that we can get like a Christmas list of great changes in government without fixing this democracy first. So, you know, Bernie published uh, last month in the Washington Post list of the 10 things that should happen in the first 100 days in the next Democratic administration. 10 great ideas. Not a single one of those ideas addressed the corruption of our political system. You know, it was just a, it was just a Christmas list of all the things that the progressives want. And, you know, I'm a progressive. I want some of those things. But the point is... Like what things were they? Well, you know, things like uh, trillion-dollar infrastructure projects, single-payer health care, free college, um, you know, all the things that Bernie is pushing mm -hmm. and has made so salient and things that I think it's great that he has made salient. I mean, he's a hero in like making these issues central to at least the debate. But what frustrates me is that instead of focusing our anger on the billionaires, which he does, we need to focus more anger on the congressmen, the politicians, which he does not. I mean, the guy's been in Congress for almost 30 years now. And so it might be natural for him not to notice that the people around him are the problem. Is it a natural thing or do you think that he's possibly aware of the consequences of stirring up that hornet's nest? Because, you know, if anybody has a right to complain, when the DNC conspired to rig the Absolutely. primaries against him, he's the number one guy. He should be screaming from the rooftops. You're dealing with a corrupt system and this is disgusting. And he didn't do that. 
And he didn't do that while Hillary Clinton was running for president, and he knew it. He knew he had been screwed out of the primaries. He knew they had conspired. He knew it was all illegal, and he kind of just kept his mouth shut. Yeah, well, I think, you know, that was a responsibility. I think yeah. that was a kind of, um, um, you know, I was a person reflecting on the horrendous outcome if he took Hillary Clinton down. And so I think he restrained himself, um, you know, not perfectly. I mean, the fact is, after it was clear he was not going to be the nominee, he still continued to talk about the, quote, corruption around Hillary, which Donald then picked up and mm -hmm. turned into uh, a weapon against her. But I think he, he recognized, you know, as every responsible politician does, that, you know, it's not just about him. It's about the future of America. So when he restrained himself and didn't want to take the whole system down then, um, I, I, I get that. But right. I'm talking about now. Right. I'm talking about when... You've got the House of Representatives talking about fundamental reform. It'll be the first thing they take up. We at least ought to have a presidential campaign where candidates are saying, hell yes, the first thing we will do is to end the corruption that makes it impossible for this Congress to function and stop pretending like we can get all these wonderful things given to us by Santa Claus without fixing this first. You've got to do the hard work of convincing America that there is a solution because, you know, the reality is I think most of America is where you started this podcast. Most of America thinks it's deeply corrupted and there's nothing that can be done. They're half right. It is deeply corrupted. But it's not true there's nothing that can be done. We can do something. And in fact, I think we can solve almost, uh, you know, 80 percent of it. I, I, I still think there's constitutional changes that might be necessary. And I've been working like how do we get constitutional changes and talking to people. Uh, my, my podcast, which of course has about one one thousandth of the one one millionth of the people listening to it that yours does. But what is your podcast so people can listen to it? It's another way. So season two is released today, which is about an Article 5 convention. But season one was about how to think about the 2020 election. Um, um, but, you know, I, I think that uh, we might have to have constitutional change, and I have been supporting the efforts to think about that. But what we've got to do is to give people a sense that there's something we can do before we amend the Constitution. You know, we did a poll and found 96 percent of Americans believe it important to reduce the influence of money in politics. Ninety one percent didn't think it was possible. So that's the politics of mm. resignation. You know, if you'd gone to Egypt under Mubarak and you'd stop the average person in the street and said, you know, what do you think of Mubarak? They would have said, you know, we hate Mubarak. And then they'd say, well, why aren't you doing anything about it? And they'd say, because nothing can be done. Or, you know, African-Americans in 1900 in America. What do you think about Jim Crow? You know, we hate Jim Crow. Well, why aren't you doing anything about it? Well, because there's nothing to be done about it. Well, that's how Americans think about this political corruption. They hate it. They think it's deeply unjust, inconsistent with what they thought America was about. But they don't do anything about it because they don't think there's anything to be done about it. And that's where leaders have a role. And what we need are leaders running for president right now to begin to explain to people, here's what we could do if only we built the power to do it. Recognizing the most important opposition here, the lobbyists in Washington are going to be an incredibly difficult group to, to defeat. But we can do that. And if we do that, Every other issue becomes easier to resolve in a sensible way.